I believe that the only excuse we have for being musicians and for making music in any fashion is to make it differently, to perform it differently, to establish the music's difference vis-a-vis -vis our own difference. I couldn't imagine a life in which I would not be surrounded by music, which shelters you from the world, which protects you, which keeps you at a certain distance from the world. Because I think that the only advantage that any artist has, or anything that any artist can really write about, and all artists do write about, whether they know it or not, is that distance from the world. I do realize it, and I know that I obtain it through media. And I know that I would have been very unhappy as a 19th century man. Certainly Gould is one of the most important artists of the 20th century by any objective measure. One of the most important pianists of all time, certainly. He is a kind of icon in the same way that James Dean is, I think. There's a myth, there's a mythical figure. Glenn was a very private person. The number of friends he had, you could probably count on one hand or even less. I believe that musicians thought that Glenn Gould was a nut, but that he was a genius nut, and that you can't ignore his playing. and with his hubris, and of course he was also extremely handsome. I simply couldn't resist him. He's been dead a quarter of a century, and we still have people interested. Not many people on this planet get to be around like Glenn is, and continues to be. Don't you feel well? I'm, uh, I'm from Canada up there. We're used to having windows out the same. Oh, Canada? What yeah. kind of a place is Canada? What kind of a... Why, where are you from, Canada? Well, uh, I don't think you'd have heard of it. It's from a little village. It's called Up the Grove. Up the Grove? Up the Grove. Up the Grove? Up the Grove. Oh, that must be something like we have in the backwoods uh, in the United States called Oshkosh. What do you do at Columbia Records? I'm a uh, pianist. You're a what? A pianist, musician. Oh, I see. Uh, what do you play? Uh, the, the, with the long hair, or do you play jazz, or bop, bop, or what? Oh, do you I'm, play? The, uh, I'm the I'm the long hair variety. You have long hair variety. Yeah. Oh, well, you must have a beautiful audience. They must be falling asleep at you. Said, um, what do you want to record first? And I said, the Goldberg Creations. And he said, well, my goodness, now for a young chap like yourself, don't you think the or the two and three part inventions would be a much safer mm -hmm. work to start with? And I said, uh, no, I don't actually. You really don't, eh? Well, all right, let's take a chance on the Goldberg. But it does. 
is. Well, maybe it's been stretched or shrunk. Um, one. I played Bach since my childhood. Of course, we all played a lot of Bach um, in our own way. And of course, somebody like that who suddenly gave us clarity and absolutely unaffected sort of um, Bach structure. Uh, that was quite unbelievable. <laughs> this guy, that each voice is so clearly etched in the eloquence with which he was able to play the left and the right hands, so they sounded almost like it was a duet played with yourself. You can't help but to marvel at it. It sounds like it's a machine. No, it's a human being playing in a way that nobody else has ever played before. Canadians, of course, he was a familiar figure from radio and television. But from the perspective of the United States and internationally, here was a totally unknown person who suddenly appeared on record in this phenomenal performance. And that seemed to come out of nowhere. Okay, let's go. Want to do the whole thing again? Yeah. Had there been music in your family? Well, not professionally, for about three generations. Our, our one claim to fame musically is that Edvard Grieg was a first cousin of mother's grandfather. A good lineage. Well, unfortunately, I don't like his piano concerto, because if I did, it would be the publicity stunt of the century. <laughs> <laughs> Had you always been able to read music? Well, I learned very young. I learned when I was perhaps three or four, you know. I, I could read music before I could read uh, words. Hmm, that's where the piano was, over there. That was like the music room. When did you actually start uh, studying? Oh, I was playing when I was about three or four, but uh, just diddling away, really. And uh, I didn't become very serious about it, I think, until I was perhaps 10 or 11 when I really began to work. With, at that time, I would say, with the idea of a career, rather vaguely. Yes, the piano was here. This was full of um, recordings and scores and that sort of thing. Ben was unbelievably untidy, of course. The amazing thing was he seemed to know where everything was. Um, I would ask him about a recording and say, oh, well, I think it's in that pile there. And it nearly always was. This was where Glenn did a lot of work, a lot of work. Do you remember what you played at your first concert? but I think the first recital was when I was about 14. Yes, I think I played a brace of Bach fugues and some Haydn, some Beethoven, some Chopin, some Mendelssohn, some Liszt. Which you haven't played since in public. <laughs> Which I haven't played since in public. <laughs> <laughs> Were you nervous? Oh, not nearly as nervous then as I am today. Really? Oh, no. Why? No. Well, you know, it was, it was all part of the game. In those days, I mean, one was sort of blissfully unaware of the responsibility of this thing in town. I just wish I could feel like that again. <laughs> Glenn didn't have any brothers or sisters, and I thought that was a great pity, because I think if he had had some sibling rivalry, it might have been very good for him. But Glenn was a very precious child. Remember, his mother had tried for years to have a child, but she suffered miscarriages. So she was maybe 43 when Glenn was born. This child was a gift from God, and she wanted Glenn to be a musician. She taught him from when he was about three until he was nine or 10, and she expected him to sing. The only problem was, as he got older, he couldn't stop singing. Glenn used to work quite late at night, so when I came here, not too long afterwards, his parents would gravitate upstairs and then they would go to bed. And unless they were very sound sleepers, um, I don't know how they could possibly have slept. Um, against Glenn's playing and also his singing. 
And I think he forgot where he was. He was in a trance. We were going on until one o'clock in the morning, until two o'clock in the morning, till three o'clock in the morning. And I'd sometimes say, Glenn, I've got to go. And he'd look at me and say, oh, you can't go now. You can't go now. And he would go right back into his trance again. Now, let me ask one question, and you need an answer. Glenn, everywhere you go, you have a special rug and a special chair, both of which look like something that fell off the back of a truck. <laughs> uh, is there any purpose? And have you ever missed these on, a, on your itineraries? And uh, Well, they get lost occasionally. What's happened um, when you haven't got your rug and chair now? Fortunately, the chair has never been lost just before a concert. If it was, I don't know what I would do. And I'm quite serious, because that chair is so designed that it will go to about 13 inches off the floor, floor, which is, as you know, extraordinarily low. And without that, I would simply have to commandeer the nearest chair and cut some of the legs off. There's nothing else I can Have do. you had to do that? Well, before I had this chair designed, I did that from hall to hall. It was a very discomforting procedure because I usually have to pay for the chairs that I well, later drove. <laughs> Who did the sawing? Well, my father finally decided Oh, you brought to... father along oh, for yes. sawing. Oh, yes. I went to Guerrero when I was 12. Glenn had gone when he was 11, so he'd been with him a year ahead of me. The initial ideas came from Guerrero, and then Glenn developed them in his own way. Guerrero sat fairly low at the keyboard, fairly close to the keyboard. As I remember his playing in those classes, we thought that Glenn was purposely mimicking Guerrero for the fun of it. And then, of course, he made that his own style later on and certainly technically the clarity that he achieved came from Guerrero's technique. I first met Glenn, I must have been about 22, and I'm eight years his senior, so he's a, a 14 years old where he, when he performed the Beethoven Fourth Piano Concerto with the Conservatory Orchestra. I think there were some rumblings about this child prodigy that was uh, roaming the halls. Along came this gangly kid sitting in a position we'd never seen a pianist sit before, and out came this, this great music making and uh, a, new, a new touch on the Beethoven Concerto. His musicianship was already there and way beyond our 22 years. The tapping that Guerrero taught us to do was to gain independence of the fingers. There's no lifting of fingers. So by tapping, you get the feeling of the pressure at the tip of the finger, but the finger just bounces back by itself. So here's what it sounds like with both hands. We all learned this detached finger technique from Thing all the time and he always had to conduct he might have one finger on the steering wheel the other was conducting and there were times when he had no fingers on the steering wheel and I would think oh Glenn where are we going you know but I just thought oh well that's Glenn he's different <laughs> oh. 
What about uh, your home in Lake Simcoe? Nice, quiet, secluded spot. Do you enjoy the seclusion of living? It's wonderful. It's, it's the most tremendous relief to get hotel living out of your system and, and be completely alone for a few weeks at a time. And this is really where the work goes on, where I prepare new things and, and rework old ones. Around 1952, Gould said that, you know, it was time for me to, to set off in my own snowshoes. He was about 19 at this time. No longer needed a piano teacher, no longer needed to go to school. And he was spending more and more time sequestered at his family's cottage on Lake Simcoe. What he was doing at this time was becoming Glenn Gould. He was thinking about music, he was practicing. And one of the projects he took upon himself during these years of retreat was to see if he could really be a composer. And this was the period in which he wrote his, really his only major work that he ever completed, the, the string quartet. He used to phone every night at 11 o'clock and play me the bit he'd just written. He was composing his uh, big string quartet. I suppose he had enormous control over himself and very intelligent, which is always fun. All his family were animals. His father was possum. His mother was mouse. He himself was spaniel. And I was fun. Did, did he ever tell you that he loved you? Yes. And did you love him? Yes. Was he very romantic? Sort of. Well, he didn't communicate easily with people. I uh, moved into a house on Glen Road, had a lovely big room, big enough for a grand. So I rented the chickering from Paul Hahn, and Glen really liked it, so he practiced on that every day to prepare for his New York debut. It was the Goldberg Variations, the Goldbergs. might get married to, to Glenn Gould, maybe one day? Yeah, one does, but uh, it didn't seem like an option at the time. Could you have been married to him, or, or do you think he would have been too difficult to live with? Too difficult to live with. Not an easy person. Gould was in the kind of bind that a lot of artists have found themselves in. They yearn for that kind of stability and companionship and particular kind of meaning that comes from a domestic life. But really, it's not compatible with their art. There's a wonderful quote from Brahms, who said something like, unfortunately, I am not married and therefore am, thank God, a bachelor. Well, there you have the contradiction right there. Well, this is a uh, pretty unusual and pleasant rehearsal studio you have here, Glenn. It is a nice spot, Gordon. This is where I get most of the work done. You're wearing your famous gloves, eh? I oh, see. Well, that's an occupational thing, you know. I, I simply have to protect my Yes, hands. your hands are very responsible. Ridiculous as it seems. Uh, Glenn, your recent European tour was an immense success. The reviews that reached us here were just uh, uh, very thrilling. How many countries did you play in? I played in Russia, Germany, and Austria. The bulk of the tour was in Russia, eight concerts in Moscow and Leningrad. The importance of the Russian tour can't possibly be exaggerated. This was in 1957, post-Stalinist Khrushchev Soviet Union. Of course, this was in the middle of the Cold War. And that was a very, very deeply troubled uh, uh, part of the world at that time. Love 
It was quite terrible <laughs> in one world. <laughs> and the government, of course, was very insecure. Although they had, they wanted to give a feeling of absolute control. There was absolute control, but they tried to exercise it. It was so uninspiring too, and so false, unbelievably false. How about the social side of uh, your trip, Glenn? Did you travel about, meet any Russians and such things? Well, um, I should say that you are much too thoroughly chaperoned by your interpreter to do much traveling about on your own. Um, I did meet a lot of the Russians, especially the musicians. What sort of music did you play? Well, I did fairly general programs, with the exception that I played a certain amount of music which is not, I think, too often heard in Russia, and did so deliberately. For the Soviets, the music of Bach was seen as effectively evangelical music. So while not completely banned, Bach was more or less banished from the concert stage and from the music culture largely. Actually, the hall was half empty because nobody knew him, of course. The oh, Bach evening, you know, in Russia, of course, there's a lot of respect for Bach, but the whole evening of Bach in a big hall, some people came, I came. And people started going to the telephones outside and phoned all their friends quickly come to this recital. You've never heard anything like this. This man's a genius. By the time of the second half, the hall filled up. For me, what I remember, it was perfect. Just his physical gifts, you know, of um, absolute control of what he's doing audio control to uh, all this connected. So we thought, well, we never quite heard Bach as it should be played. Did you speak to the Russian people? They describe Gould's visit as a Martian coming to Earth or coming to their world. He had the appearance of this consumed genius. And I think there's some, that, something that appealed deeply to the Russian sensibilities in that, this complete devotion to his art and complete perfection in his art. We were so isolated, basically. And our scale of values was so limited, you see. Uh, all the same, we felt that that was quite an extraordinary event because the personality of this young person was quite unusual, quite incredible. So that's very interesting that we realized it somewhere in the depths of our hearts, you know. I think there was something about the transcendence of Gould's music. He offers music in a way that brings this serene, sort of ecstatic vision that takes us away from the troubles of the world to some extent. I think Gould knew that music had that power, and that power was never more thoroughly welcomed and embraced than uh, during his 1957 tour of the Soviet Union. At the last concert, the orchestral concert in Leningrad, there was a very great demand for tickets, and so over and above fire regulations, they admitted 1,100 standees <laughs> up and down the aisles in herds. I mean, this was something fantastic. If anyone had fainted, they would have had no place to collapse. He denied that he loved applause. What he loved was that the music meant so much to them personally. They listened as though their life depended on it. And he found this absolutely fantastic. Made him want to give them everything he had. When 
know how the uh, Russians reacted to you with immense enthusiasm. Uh, how did you react to them? Well, needless to say, this is one of the most exciting two weeks I've ever spent. The last time I was here was after Glenn had left. I came once with him. Um, he had to pick things up here. He was striking out on his own, and I used to make a few suggestions to him about his parents, and I don't think he appreciated it somehow. I felt his parents had done so much for him. Their whole lives had evolved around Glenn. So I felt that they were getting older and that he had to worry about them a bit. In the four years since I've known Glenn, he's grown from a small town hick. Right, just I beg your one pardon. doggone <laughs> minute. Well, I mean, after all, he was a kid that came out of Toronto, and I don't think you'd ever been out of Toronto, really, since I met you four years ago. My dear sir, I had toured the Canadian provinces widely. That's what I mean. You were a provincial <laughs> hick. Because he came to us as a small boy with chicken feathers and straw in his hair. He could play the piano like a whirlwind, and he did his first piece that he did. He recorded for us, which no one had ever done, the Goldberg Variations, which was on the bestseller list. And here it was a bestseller list with an unknown as I say, really, is a small town boy, you know. I mean, they expect you to have a Maori uniform or something. <laughs> My husband and I were driving down Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles, and suddenly my husband leaned over towards the radio, which was on, and said, oh, shh, uh, pull over, pull over, pull over. I have to hear this. And it was the Bach Goldberg Variations, and we listened to the entire thing. Of course, it turned out to be Glenn Gould. What Glenn had done is taken the piece metaphorically cut it apart and put it together as if he was taking a clock apart and then putting it back together in a very strange way. It still made sense, of course, but it made a totally different kind of sense. And no one had ever done that before. And it was a very remarkable way of, of thinking about that music. I personally didn't like it too much because uh, uh, I think it destroyed what Mr. Bach wanted. But uh, I can see that any musician would be fascinated by it. Uh, and of course, also the playing. The playing was superb, beyond superb. months later, Leonard Bernstein was conducting the premiere of a new work of my husband's, this time cycle. And a very tall man in a very long overcoat and gloves and scarf on came down the aisle and said to my husband, excuse me, I've been wanting to meet you. My name is Glenn Gould. And my husband turned around and said, oh my goodness, you're Glenn Gould. I just heard your fantastic Goldberg variations. And Glenn said, well, I think you're the best pianist alive today. Glenn greatly admired Lucas. He thought he was an absolutely exceptional person, an exceptional composer, exceptional musician, exceptionally intelligent. Glenn would call regularly and talk to Lucas, and sometimes Lucas wouldn't be there, and then he would talk to me. And after a while, he would be talking longer to me than he was to Lucas. Well, he was enormously engaging. He was charming, he was funny, he was tremendously intelligent, just so much fun to talk to. When Gould first became a sensation in the mid and late 50s, this was a time of great cultural ferment in New York, in literature and in music and in painting. And a lot of musicians in his situation would have been thrilled 
to be able to hang out with the Bernsteins and the Fosses. He always kept his distance from it. Rather than attend glittering New York parties, he seemed more interested in just getting back home. I don't think Glenn ever wanted to be part of any group. It was absolutely anathema to him. He was solitary. He wasn't private, but he was solitary. What's fascinating about people who accomplish anything in the arts is that they are used to an enormously high degree of concentration. And that's inspiring to see. When you think of composers who compose all by themselves, painters are generally alone in their studios. The energy is really something that comes from the love of doing what you're doing. And of course, energy that you use in that way is self-generating. The more energy you use, the more energy you get. It's most important that you bring the same intensity and I attribute this mostly then to something you said before it's very interesting on why you don't live in New York City the most difficult thing for for a musician particularly when New York is to a certain extent representing debut town you know it yes. represents the most yes. dangerous well, it's the, 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 trap the, the place the where one fights for one's career it's the trap of the world and if one has to combine that with uh, it being hometown these are because it, for most people and certainly for me the most difficult place to play in is one hometown you know i go through agonies when i have to play in toronto new york bothers me almost not at all but toronto is, That's is sheer hell came to touring, Glenn Gould was infamous for canceling performances. I remember when I approached Walter Homburger and said, uh, Walter, I want Glenn for the opening of my second season with the Brahms First Piano Concerto. But I must tell you, Walter, if he lives up to his reputation and doesn't show, I'm going to sue him. <laughs> so Walter said, don't worry, he won't do that to you. Well, sure enough, he played that performance and canceled the next performance he was supposed to go to further west in Canada. If you are playing a concert every second or third night for a month, this seems, in a way, um, a reasonably um, normal way to live at the time. It's only when one gets away from it that one realizes what a crazy artificial existence it is. I can only say that I feel something like I did as a child when I, it was Labor Day, and the next day meant going back to school. This was a completely um, horrible feeling. It was the feeling of being consigned to the netherworld, you know? Gould hated concert life, musically, temperamentally, logistically. He hated being dragged from city to city and hotel to hotel, unfamiliar pianos, conductors he doesn't know. He canceled concerts whenever he could. He canceled whole tours because he just couldn't face it. As a musician, and when I'm with so many of my colleagues, and when we're talking about various cities or, you know, I just played in Amsterdam or I just played here in Berlin or this or that. And what do we talk about? There's a great restaurant in this city. And, and we, you know, we talk about exactly where it was or, or there's a great museum and all this and that. With Glenn, when you talked about a certain city, all he could think of was, oh, yes, that's the city where I was caught in a draft. And... And, and I felt this draft come to my shoulder, and I, all of a sudden I couldn't move my shoulder, and then that developed into a terrible flu. And, you know, every memory that he had was just a bad one, and it was so sad to me. I don't think he enjoyed one minute of his life when he was uh, concertizing. Glenn used to get very intense over certain things, and in the days in which he was giving concerts, 
I felt he needed a complete break. I love Shakespeare and he loved Shakespeare too. So I said, well, why don't we read Shakespeare together? Well, he thought this was an absolutely wonderful idea. His favorite play was Richard II. And you can guess who played Richard. He always felt that I made a great John of Gaunt. But then we got on to other things. We started reading Oscar Wilde and eventually we got to improvisations. I think this is all very good, very good for him. Certainly, we loved it. He was such a quirky, strange kind of guy for a classical musician. This was a guy who, you know, sat around with his feet up all the time and, and dressed in funny costumes and, you know, played characters in funny voices. And, you know, Herbert von Karajan didn't do that kind of thing. And for people who don't have much interest in classical music, and even for some people who are part of the classical music world, he provides some relief from this conservatism of the classical music business. Lordy Lord, how they love romancing When you see Miss Dorothy What a personality Yes, she is super fine All the quelvos fall in line When she moves them hips in a funny way Dance all night and sleep all day Then she starts a polishing Lordy Lord, how she love romancing <laughs> How do you feel about pictures? Must I? Well, we need them, yeah. John. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you're here today. You know, I just think it'd be a good idea to get Glenn to at least put a scarf and some gloves on. How about the gloves? Are you kidding? How about the gloves up on the piano? I'm glad you know I never kid with you. I've had quite enough of that sort of picture. We'll not, no, no. It's good enough for England and AP. I already had heard about him you know, and about his idiosyncrasies. And so I probably knew that I was going to find somebody who wasn't quite like me, shall we say. <laughs> mm. Rhapsody in blue. That's all I got. He never showed any negative attitude toward having his, his picture done. Definitely he knew what he was doing, because I think it was really natural to him. He was so easy in front of the camera, and he was so involved in the, in the music when he was playing, of course. He trusted me, I'm happy to say. There is one picture of him that has always been in my mind where he's sitting in a room with large windows behind him. He's facing right at the camera, and his head has dropped a little bit. I think it was just true Glenn Gould. He was somewhat of a darling in the media. Not only was he being reviewed in all the music magazines, but popular interest magazines like McLean's, like Life magazine, even Vogue and Glamour. Not just because of his playing, but also because of his rather striking appearance and personality. If I may, I'd like to touch on a topic that might be a little tender, I don't know, and that is when a critic uh, plays up your eccentricities on stage and off, is it... Uh, Jury, Not in the does it hurt your feelings? No, it doesn't hurt my feelings in the slightest. Well, he was pragmatic, and he was a businessman. He knew perfectly well that the image was going to help sell records. Now, before we came up to the studio, uh, you asked if it was going to be properly heated. It doesn't bother me because we're all friends, but does this make you feel better? 
Well, it does, yes. Even if they aid only the mental capacity to carry on, you know, these That's things right. are psychological aids, and as such, they cannot be overdone. So often, when an individual is so heavily endowed with a particular kind of genius, these other kinds of personality aberrations uh, come with that. And I think it was probably interpreted in some circles as a crass marketing ploy of some kind to wear the coat, hum through the recordings, and so on. I remember his mother phoning me. She said, I'm really disturbed by what's happening with Glenn. I, do you think this is going to be all right? And I said, this is what happens in the big time. And the, when the publicity people get a hold of something, they latch on to things that perhaps are extracurricular. I hope he doesn't fall into some trap, that's all. And of course, they did cash in on some of the idiosyncrasies because it sells tickets, unfortunately. You just focus on the different ways he presents himself. There's no end to the interest. Why do people all over the world find themselves drawn to Gould? It's not just because he was a great player. It's because his life is itself a, a performance that people can't take their eyes away from. In every age, there are styles of performance that, that one expects to hear. And in, that, in the period in which Glenn Gould started to play, there were a number of great virtuosos playing. There was Horowitz and Serkin and Rubinstein and many, many others. And he definitely went against the grain of those players because he went inside the music and tried to go inside the composer's mind. And then when he came out on the other side, the piece was so thoroughly internalized that I think he went beyond identifying with the composer and he, he felt the, a total identity of himself with the music that he played. Glenn often recorded pieces with different articulation, he would change some things and change. very often the tempi would be quite different from what he had done on an earlier recording. Um, just to give you an example is the way he plays the Turkish rondo. This quite surprises me because uh, usually this is played at a fairly good pace. Glenn does. Canadian composer Oscar Moravitz wrote a piece for Glenn Gould to play it. Now, I don't know what the piece was, but the story goes that Glenn Gould starts playing, and Oscar, who was an ebullient person, stood up and said, no, Glenn, it's not that way, it's this way. And then uh, Gould supposedly got it from the piano and said, Oscar, please sit down. You don't understand your own piece. Another piece that surprised me was Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata, which we're all so familiar with. And here, Glenn chooses to play at a faster tempo than usual and keep it absolutely strict. There's no rubato, there's nothing to show changes of harmony. It's absolutely the same all the way through, and it really surprised me when I heard what he did with this. Gould always said that why would I make another recording of a Mozart piano concerto, if it was going to sound like every other recording of a Mozart piano concerto. Or, for that matter, if it was going to sound like any other recording I had previously made. What would be the point? And of course that's hugely true, and I think that's one of the reasons uh, cl the classical music culture at a certain point became a bit sort of dry and a, a bit museum-like. You know, the performances all sounded the same. You knew exactly what you were going to hear. You were going to hear a wonderful virtuosic performance, uh, undoubtedly, and that was, uh, that was of some value in itself, listening to a recording or listening to a concert. Um, 
But what Gould uh, uh, said is that, yeah, this needs to be something new. You need to bring a new perspective, uh, new ideas. Um, and don't worry unduly about the, uh, the details uh, of, the, of the written text. The composer, him or herself, very often wasn't unduly concerned about the details of the, uh, of the text. So that's a longer standing influence, I think, uh, certainly for me, and I think all uh, musicians and pianists take that from Gould. Just play it how Hollywood would play it. Well, I, I think Hollywood would play it with, with strings, of course, dubbed in. So what's wrong with that? Well, nothing really, except that it takes all the juice out of it, because uh, what I was trying to do was to play it so maddeningly slowly that in, I had to get, at that moment, everybody's hackles aroused. I had to get a reaction. Um, and having got that reaction with this incredibly apostrophe, apostrophe performance. I gradually let out each variation a little bit more than the one before it, and then finally doing one really perverse thing, and that is taking a variation that Mozart has, forgive me, actually marked adagio and turning it into uh, an allegretto, and that came out like this. And gradually, the whole movement took off. And um, it's a very, very um, peculiar thing to it's do. It's a very that. arbitrary thing to do. But it works. I can only tell you it works. And it works on um, a work that I hope, for most people, has become sufficiently jaded that, that they'll say, ah. On the other hand, they may say, ah. You know, one never knows. But that's but, really what you're aiming to do, is to make people sit up on their seats from the first note and say, this is an event. This is a happening. Yes. Almost, a if you want happening. it in one word, yes. The Canadian pianist Glenn Gould is to be soloist now, Leonard Bernstein conducting the New York Philharmonic, in a performance of the Piano Concerto No. 1 in D minor by Brahms. I think Mr. Bernstein will have something to say to the audience, so down to the stage. You are about to hear a rather, shall we say, unorthodox performance of the Brahms D minor concerto, I cannot say I am in total agreement with Mr. Gould's conception. And this raises the interesting question, who is the boss, the soloist or the conductor? I'm conducting it because Mr. Gould is so valid and serious an artist that I must take seriously anything he conceives in good faith. I have only once before had to submit to a soloist's wholly new and incompatible concept, and that was the last time I accompanied Mr. Gould. <laughs> but, but this time, the discrepancies between our views are so great that I feel I must make this small disclaimer. never in my life heard of a situation where a conductor comes out on the stage and said, I don't agree with what the soloist is doing, but I'll go along with it. You just don't do that. I mean, as your role as a conductor when you're accompanying is to accompany the soloist. You can't always have the same mindset about how the music should go. That's what makes music making so exciting. When he played the Brahms D minor with Leonard Bernstein, the New York Philharmonic, there were howls of derision from certain uh, critics in New York. I mean, one of them said, Glenn Gould is a very great performer, very great performer, but at the moment he's quite unfit for public performance. And another one, 
famous one by Harold Schoenberg of the New York Times indicated that Glenn played it slowly because he was incapable of playing it faster. His technique wasn't good enough, which, of course, was preposterous. It was a thing that was talked about for months afterwards because people that knew Bernstein knew that Lenny was a flamboyant, incredible character, and he wouldn't have liked Glenn Gould's manipulation of the tempo to a place that wasn't good for Bernstein. Because there was a certain feeling that Bernstein was kind of a bully, a musical bully, and he was always trying to get people to do things his way. Although I think Bernstein was gracious enough to understand Gould's genius and say, okay, that's the way you play it, I'm gonna play it the way you play it. And he felt that he had to give the disclaimer about this is not the way I hear this piece because he was, you know, Lenny was a, he was a showman, he was a character, and also a composer in his own right and a beautiful pianist. And again, we're talking two geniuses. You can get two guys like that together, look out. <laughs> the whole thing became a great kerfuffle. One of the events, I think, that really made him decide that this concert business just had to go. I don't know that there's a satisfactory explanation. As far as what actually transpired last year, I seemed to be the only person around who felt that Mr. Bernstein's speech was full of the best of good spirits and great charm. And I, in fact, I, I um, sat backstage giggling before playing the thing. I could, I could hardly stop laughing when we started. I, I thought it was delightful. After Gould left concert life, he knew that he wanted to do other things, but he wasn't entirely certain, I don't think, at the beginning exactly what he wanted to do. He talked about composing, he was interested in broadcasting, he was interested in writing, and these were new ventures for him, and he was learning as he was going. Glenn, your voluntary switch from the concert stage to the electronic media is very possibly a pioneering step. I understand that it's even gone so far that you're now producing shows. When Glenn came into the studio, he had a pile of records under this arm and a pile of papers and everything else under that arm, and he walked over to the counter in this control room and he handed me a script. Of course, of Hudson's Bay, this flat, flat I don't go, let me say this again, I don't go for this Northmanship bit at all. Because it just uh, seemed endless. One of the first things that I did was a program called The Idea of North. It was about the North. And I found there some rather extraordinary human beings, people who have gone North not simply because it offered time and a half pay or because they had to escape from something inside themselves that was eating at them and making urban life untenable, because they really had something to find out about themselves. They wanted to make inquiries about themselves. When you're living in the big city in the South, you can always retreat. When you fail in your relations with society, you can just go away and nobody really knows the difference. You can't go away when you're in a little village a thousand miles from nowhere and a couple of weeks from the next plane, high in the Arctic. Yes, it's a show about the North only because it's set in the North but it's really about the northern part of our beings, about the essence of getting along with ourselves when there is nothing else to get along with. Gould referred to his radio documentaries as close to autobiographical statements as he's likely to ever offer. And I think that's true in the sense that they all dealt with solitude in some way and what it means to be apart from the mainstream. 
You're excluding the rest of the world that will never understand, and you've made your own world with these other people. And probably what you'll never know, and what nobody else will ever know, is whether you're kidding yourself or not. Have you really made your peace with these other people, or, or have you made a peace? Because the only alternative to peace is a kind of crack up. That's why I find radio documentary especially so very fascinating because one can make a statement about the human condition by virtue of the way in which you can define it through using the human voice. We had a wonderful time doing the show and I think it speaks for itself and then we went on to do other shows and obviously by this point Glenn and I had built up quite a solid relationship. Wait a minute, maybe seven, we could cut back to seven. Um... Lorne, of course, was a leading technician, and he did a lot of work with Glenn. But it was difficult because Glenn worked very slowly but very meticulously, and he would only accept the very best. Same difference. And if he felt that he hadn't taken the right approach, he would want to do it again. OK, let me hear that last bar again. And this is extremely demanding for everyone else concerned. Um, tell me, can we get in on the upbeat? Would that be the easiest? Go back about two bars and I'll show you what I Gould was very much pushing the envelope in terms of the available technology of the day. And Lauren was a very willing and very competent assistant to him in that process. Do you want me to physically cut this or do you want yeah, to just Yeah, I might as well take it out and put it up on the machine. But you're right on the note, right? Yeah. They spent hundreds of hours together working in the close confines of, of the studio to get these programs right. And they eventually became very close friends. I mean, I was away from home quite a lot. I mean, I got to a point where I'd come home and my kids would call me, sir. There were times when I would just want to get away, and be by myself and have some room to think and, and uh, quite frequently, Rightly or wrongly, I would go across and sit in the pub across the road because I knew that's the one place Glenn would never come and look for me. It gave me a bit of thinking and space to be in by myself. You know, the strange part is that I would come out of the pub, say, 2 o'clock in the morning or 1.30, and I would walk up the street to sort of Bloor Street and over a couple of blocks. And sure enough, every night that I came up there, Glenn would be sitting there waiting for me. And he would open the door, hop in, take me home, and we'd sit outside the house and talk sometimes for an hour or so. Or he'd come inside and I'd make him some scrambled eggs or whatever have you. And probably lived as much at our house as he did at his apartment. So. And eventually, Glenn said he wanted me to be his brother. And he wanted us to go down to City Hall or go to his lawyers and make it legal. And I said, well, Glenn, you know, I'd very much love to be your brother. I think that would be wonderful. But I have four brothers and a sister who have some say into this. And Glenn just instantly stopped and said, that is very dear. And he never asked me again. In my view, Glenn was a very lonely person. He knew lots of people, for sure. He knew lots of people on the telephone. But that's quite different to having uh, real friends. That he was somebody who showed you what he wanted to show of himself at that time, or what he felt he could. But there was also that other part which was hidden, which was not evident but one knew was there. Gould himself was so secretive about his private life that he encouraged people to think that there was some awful dark secret there. And the notion of Gould being this ascetic person, this asexual person, you know, Gould exaggerated all that for public consumption. Of course, the big dark secret turns out to be that he just had comparatively normal private 
you know, relations with women of a rather ordinary kind. So I just basically rummaged through some closets and came up with uh, a one box especially that was that had some albums in it and some papers. I don't think anyone's touched it for 35, 40 years. So, wow. so these were taken, it, it says here, in June of 68. And so here, here's my mother and Glenn on this ferry. My mother looking very, and, and Glenn looking very happy. And they were sort of a chic couple in a way. I had more or less left my husband, and uh, uh, the marriage was over, uh, as far as I was concerned. And I th thought, well, yes, I am going to marry Glenn. And he wanted the children and, and me to come to Toronto and start divorce proceedings, etc. And he had already contacted lawyers to see how it could best be done. However, my husband had an enormous ego and was not at all sure that I was going to be doing this. So when I left, I said, you're not taking this very seriously. You know I'm going to go off to Toronto now with the children, and I'm marrying Glenn Gould. And he said, don't be ridiculous. You're not going to marry him. I'll see you next weekend. Have fun. I remember Glenn saying that she was coming with the children and finally, the day they came, Glenn was waiting with anticipation, and then he just let it slip. Well, of course, they're moving here. He was absolutely devoted to her, and I suspect she was to him. Here, for instance, is a shot of Glenn and my mother walking down the road in this sort of desolate area, very beautiful, but desolate. And here is that famous dusty, dirty, Chevy Impala. I, I, you know, I know we had one too, so I'm not sure if it was Glenn's or ours, but, uh, and that's the sort of typical, really uninteresting motorhome environment that Glenn favored. I think, you know, anything pretentious made him ill, frankly. So, which I understand, which I totally understand. I'm not a great travel person. I'd just as soon not be in a car driving around. <laughs> but, the children loved it, and Glenn loved it, so. He loved going on car trips and taking the children to Muskoka and showing them all sorts of things. You could always tell when a lake was coming up because the mountains would start looking blue. I still remember that. He loved children. He would have made a wonderful father. I have scattered memories. I think probably the first thing I think of is his very, very red hands. <laughs> I think that was the thing that I noticed first as a child, because, you know, he used to soak his hands. I do remember the move. It was a little hard. I do remember that. And I remember staying in this strange sort of hotel before we moved into a house that overlooked a graveyard. <laughs> and that was, my, that was sort of my first memory. You know, it was certainly traumatic at first, but, but Glenn was very warm and very caring, and my experiences with him, they were great. He loved animals, and within weeks, he had found a uh, real collie dog, or collie as he called it, and Glenn loved playing with it, and he loved to get the children to play with it. One day, however, Baffy, as he was called, he bit Glenn. That wasn't so funny. And he then gave us another dog, a Border Collie. For a while there, there was a bit of an issue. There was this dynamic of resenting Glenn. I realized he was the stand-in for my father and not really appreciating that. And one thing that stands out is that I remember resisting calling him Uncle Glenn. He's not my uncle mother, you know. But he was actually extremely cautious and careful not to presume to be that father. And he was uh, extremely respectful and sweet about my father. And the fact is that Glenn became someone I ended up loving, adoring, 
He was very kind and sweet to me and very avuncular to use the, in, in the sense that he was my Uncle Glenn in, in a re very real way. Glenn seemed so happy at the time and so at peace. Um, I suppose we all have our demons, and I think he had a few every now and again. But I think it was a very special thing for him, a very special thing. The flip side of the whole experience was, at the same time, going home to Dad. And this is Dad, he, this is the house he took in Fort Erie across the border. So this would be a kind of weekend thing. And this is typical of, like, we all got along beautifully, and we were so glad to be with my father. And I have very good memories of that, too. It was a very straightforward triangle. <laughs> Triangles have happened since uh, the cavemen, I suppose. I had differences with my husband. I left him. I fell in love with someone else. And in the meantime, my husband did his best to woo me back. There was really no great mystery to it. Glenn, I know half a dozen impresarios dying to present you in concerts. They offer to pay you any fee that you name. Why do you deny them all? Because it's not a very enticing prospect, John. It's a very flattering one, I suppose, but it's not an enticing prospect. The, the life of a glamorous concert artist is hideous, is dead, is, is part of the past. You know, it's very difficult to walk out on the stage and to perform. You are burying your soul. You're burying everything about you. Uh, it's like standing on a stage stark naked. I detest audiences, not in their individual components, but en masse, I detest audiences. I think they're a force of evil. It seems to me rule of mob law. Getting on the concert stage, it's like a bullfight. Some of those people root for the bull to win over the matador. And in music, the same kind of thing can happen where you can fail, but sometimes the failures in a concert can be the most exciting parts of them. And, and that the ability of the musician to grab a hold at the moment and make things happen is probably the most exciting part of music. It can't be done in a recording, although I think Gould goes to the edges of his expressive ability, which is fast, on recordings. And very few people can do that because many people need the audience to drive them to go to that distance. Jim, what would happen if we had a sort of um, variable perspective? Instead of having just one kind of chambery sound that we're getting At out, the time that Gould stopped performing, of course, it was a very big deal, especially for someone who was celebrated, to even contemplate not having a regular concert schedule. You're at the peak of room sound, and then you start to back off until you get to... But what became unexpected fruit of that was this defense of recorded music as the reality of music. He happened to come along at a time when the technology for recording music was really starting to take off and really got behind that as a real advocate and innovator. There ...and then get back out just before the double bars um, at... Get that back to whatever is our... Business. Gould had some very fanciful theories about what the possibilities of recording and broadcasting technologies were. They were fanciful in the 1960s. They are simply how we do business today in the 21st century. You know, I have a feeling that the end result of all our labors in the recording studio it's not going to be some kind of autocratic finished product such as we turn out now, but it's going to be a rather more democratic assemblage now. I think we're going to make kits, and I think we're going to send out these kits, and we're going to say do it yourself, and be in fact your own editor, be in a sense your own performer. And of course, this just sounded lunatic in the 60s, but in essence, that's not only what we can do now on our desktops, but we do do. You know, you hear these stories about someone re-editing, you know, a Star Wars movie to take out a character they don't like. Uh, that is a Gouldian kit. 
Well, you are a strange breed of recreative musical artist, Glenn. I mean, you're in the record business and the radio business and the television business. Didn't you recently do a show on the pop singer Pet Clark? I did indeed. It was my first and quite probably last foray into the whole field of folk rock, or whatever they're calling it these days. It was great fun to do. The buildings reach up to the sky. The okay, chickadees, here's the one you've been asking for, and tonight it's specially dedicated to Paul from Doris, Pet Clark, with that question we've all been asking. Who am I? He loved to listen to this music while driving in his car. He would turn the Tula Clark up uh, full blast, uh, as he describes, while driving into the Canadian North. I can drive to match my driving speed to the distance between relay outlets. Came to hear it most hours, and in the end to know it, if not better than the soloist, at least as well, perhaps, as most of the sidemen who were booked for the date. After several hundred miles of this exposure, I checked into the hotel at Marathon and made plans to contemplate the Tula. I thought it was a bit tongue-in-cheek, you know. I didn't think he'd really, really meant it. Because, you know, pop music, classical music, there's the great divide, you know. I do think it started from genuine admiration for her and, and interest in her music. And she may have been one of those women that he was sort of half in love with from afar. I think Barbara Streisand falls into that category. And maybe Mary Tyler Moore, whose TV show he was always videotaping for some reason. When you're alone and life is making you lonely, you can always go downtown. I think the main interest in that project though was he had some sort of sociological comments that he wanted to make about pop music and so it was that larger theme that drew him to the project. The lights are much brighter there. You can't forget all your troubles, forget all your cares, so go downtown. Things will be great. It is a strange connection and at the same time, why not? It's a real regret for me not having met him. We would have got on very well. And who knows, we may have brought something out in one another that uh, would have been interesting. It may have been a very arbitrary and sort of post-Freudian glance at folk rock, and I don't intend to do it again. It was my first and last attempt, but it was great fun. Jim, I'm back at the third one, opening up the backs now. Okay, as soon as you're ready, if uh, Glenn would give us a test of that. Okay. He hated going to New York and doing the recordings. What they tried to do is set up a remote uh, recording well, studio yeah. in Toronto. And Glenn bought all this yeah, equipment. We'll the At the time, it was state of the earth. And Lauren sad. asked me to help. And that's how I got involved. I, I was just arms and legs. Okay, there's about 90 for you. Okay, let's try that then, please. Same thing again? Same thing. The arrangement was that he could record in Toronto with the condition that he had a proper place to record in. Well, this, of course, for Glenn, okay. was an open invitation for him, and CBS would pay him for doing the recordings here. Hello, hello. Hello, Glenn. Uh, okay, so you're going to buy the test. It was a strange feeling to be going to a recording session at Eaton's department store. And of course the store was closed and there was a guard who came to open the door. And then we had to walk through the entire first floor. I remember walking through the lingerie department. That was such a strange feeling. Uh, going to the elevator, coming up to the seventh floor and I walk in and there's this old auditorium in the middle of this department store. I could not believe it. I remember seeing the grand pianos and all the microphones, everything set up. And I started clapping my hands because that's how one can tell a little bit about acoustics. And it felt great. It was resonant and all that. And then uh, Glenn went to the piano and started playing. and. Uh, I, I love the sound in here, and I realized he was, he was right. This is a great place to record. 
Okay, insert one, take two. We usually started recording around 11 at night, and the sessions went till 4 or a couple of times went till 5 in the morning. I never really realized what a great pianist he was until we started recording together. I was mesmerized, and I could not believe the technique that he had. It was absolutely extraordinary. And in all the times that we, all the set hours we spent recording, I don't think we ever had to do a take again because he missed a note. I don't think he knew what it was to miss a note. He was just, it was absolute perfection. That had better work. I remember one particular take of the slow moon of the E major, of the third moon of the E major sonata, and it was really a wonderful take from beginning to end. It could have been used the entire take without any kind of splicing. But somehow that didn't sit very well with Glenn because after all, this is a recording and recordings are made to be spliced and to be put together. So no matter how good it was, we had to do something a little different in this bar. No, let's use this bar, the, an, another take for this particular bar. <laughs> and I, I found that it was a, that was kind of a, a little bit strange, I thought. It isn't really prepared enough for the, for the cadence part. I should have gotten the soft pedal on a little earlier. I would say probably the late 60s, early 70s was sort of the point in Gould's life where the most things were going the most right at the same time. He was enormously prolific in terms of the amount of recordings he was putting out. He was already deeply into a very innovative kind of radio. Cornelia Foss had, had moved to Toronto. Obviously, that was a very close relationship of the kind that he had never had before. Artistically speaking, and in some ways personally speaking, that was sort of his best and most productive time where these control issues were paying some dividends, shall we say. Take down one and two. Now the opposite. Glenn liked to control the situation. Mind you, he didn't try to control people. Take down two, just leave one. But he liked to control situations, particularly the ones that involved him. When we were doing editing and stuff on tapes, I mean, yes, I did all the editing, but he did all the marking and decided what takes went where. This is take one. To be honest, Glenn was a bit of a control freak. <laughs> no, wait a minute. No, no, don't. Hold, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, let me see. Uh, start in the middle position with one tight shot. He'd created this world for himself where he could control it. And it was demanding if you work for him. You were expected to give a lot. And he knew it. He, he, you know, he drove himself hard and he drove other people hard. Don't make one too loud. Okay, drop two slowly. So that on the last chord you just have one. Take it down, take it down, take it down, take it down. Absolutely should be pristine. There's no question that Gould's obsessiveness had serious downsides. After he quit concert life, he really was unwilling to say a word in public that wasn't scripted. He s insisted on writing both the questions and the answers for an interview. And there are film productions of his where he is reading scripts off cue cards in which he's trying to be chummy and personable. What, what an odd instrument you've got there. I think it has a rather nice tone, actually. I'm talking about this, this, uh, this thing now, which I, I don't Mister, know how to call it. Monsieur, you will not speak disrespectfully of a member of the family. How do you mean, a member of the family? It is a boon traveling companion, without which I do not function. I cannot operate. It has you been with me for 21 years. You've actually this given... This thing, which actually, otherwise no one has a chair. You've actually given concert on this? 
Back in the 50s when he was giving these wonderful spontaneous interviews, he could be wonderfully charming and, and personable. But when he put that personality through the ringer, you get the sense that he never realized that he was in some ways becoming less interesting to look at and listen to by so heavily uh, controlling and, and scripting himself. In the beginning, everything went beautifully, but as uh, time went on, the eccentricities became more and more important. And uh, um, overshadowed, really, his personality. The relationship with him, I think, must have been a little suffocating, uh, you know, for my mother. Um, on a, one hand, it was very intense and in, engaged, and uh, they just spoke every day for hours. You know, but that's what I mean. He was known to speak for hours on the phone. She ended up relinquishing a part of her her own um, herself uh, and and what she wanted to be in life uh, for his sake and I think it couldn't be any other way is really what I'm saying that's what Glenn needed the last year of course became increasingly difficult my life became more and more restricted as his paranoia became more evident it really became impossible for me to do anything without uh, being supervised, so to speak. Not being able to paint, which I really couldn't in Toronto, was a limitation I simply couldn't accept. He became more and more difficult, and, and uh, I think that was due to the fact that he was uh, uh, taking uh, antidepressants and, and anti-anxiety pills. And uh, at the time, no one really understood how tremendously uh, dangerous these things were. And his personality began to change radically. There was less and less of, of Glenn. And another, somebody else began to emerge. I think um, life was not, not easy, not easy for him. He had visions of things he wanted to do, perhaps of relationships he would like to have, but getting there was something else, was something else. I'm sure that he sensed that things were not going well. And I think he became increasingly paranoid, which only made matters worse, of course. On one hand, my husband, who was just as charming as Glenn, uh, was trying to woo me back. And at the same time, Glenn, as I said, was becoming less and less of the Glenn that I had fallen in love with. Also, I had my children to consider. And uh, it was a very difficult decision, but I finally decided that I really had to leave. Um, and did so with great regret. All I remember is being upset already then, you know, feeling I was now forsaking Glenn instead of the other way around. When we, when we had arrived, I felt we were forsaking my dad. And now we're going back to my dad. I was thrilled about that, but still had real qualms and so I was I just remember being um, kind of in shock but also sort of saying you know what this is for the best it's for the best I don't know how a child knows it but they they, they want they want their whole family together they I really did so I was very happy when we moved back with my father except that confusing again for a ch child who gain something and loses something at the same time and doesn't quite know how to deal with that because we certainly didn't see um, Glenn very much after that uh, and and that was a, I was sad about that and I missed him and I didn't understand 
I remember one sort of farewell meeting. He came to New York to see us in this hotel room, which I think was the Essex house. Already some of the intimacy had been broken, so everybody was a bit shy. And it was awkward. You know, I remember that nobody could really say what they felt. I had a strong feeling that this was a goodbye for all of us. In all of Gould's private papers that have survived, I've only found one document that actually explicitly um, contained any material dealing with Cornelia Foss. And one of those is a page-long record, which makes rather pitiable reading, of his efforts to call her, and either getting the maid or getting the daughter or getting the husband and being told, she'll call you right back, and then she doesn't. It records his frustration at trying to get her on the phone. And then some pages later in the same document, he's talking about why should I maintain this relationship? And he's sort of asking himself, what are the reasons for maintaining it? What are the reasons for ending it? What are the reasons for doing nothing and keeping the status quo? It's unusually open and confessional. You don't often find Gould on paper in that mood. But beyond these two very late documents, their relationship is completely undocumented in his papers. I did see Glenn one more time. The following summer, I had rented a house with a friend in Wainscott, that's in Long Island. Lucas and I were s still separated in a way. I mean, we were staying in separate houses, but we had pretty much gotten back together again. Glenn told me that he was coming down to see me. Well, he did not say, I'm coming down to see you in order to get you to come back. It turned out that that was the reason, but he didn't say that. And we went for a walk on the beach. And of course, by that time, he was even more eccentric than he had been when I first came to Toronto. And it was middle of the summer, and he was wearing his coat, yes, and he was wearing gloves, and he was wearing a hat, so it was a little odd. But we took a long walk on the beach, and he was very distraught. He very much wanted to have us come back and resume this relationship, and I realized I couldn't possibly do that. It was a very sad moment in my life, and that was the last time I saw him. There remains an element of mystery to the whole relationship and the whole, this whole segment of my life, their life. So, uh, you know, there's, and it's not as if anybody in my family is shy about talking about things, but, um, you know, there are certain things that to this day don't, don't entirely make total sense, but uh, people lead sort of eccentric lives sometimes and it doesn't have to make sense. When these things happen in life, life has to go on. What happened was that Glenn threw himself into his work. But it was clear that a light had dimmed in his life. For people to get that close to him was very unusual. And never again, I think, did um, a similar thing happen. When I was researching Gould's biography, I, 
quickly discovered that a lot of the Gould myths were exaggerations in some way or another. The one Gould myth that wasn't necessarily exaggerated was his hypochondria. He was involved in a positive cocktail of uh, pills. And I said to him a number of times, this is extremely dangerous to do. And he just would grin and say, oh, do you think so? There was one episode with the border people who thought he had too many, shall we say, prescription drugs or not. He just had too many of them. And they actually, I mean, they stripped him. You know, the only diagnosis that he would never accept is the one that said, you know, you've got to start eating right, you've got to start sleeping properly, you've got to stop taking so many pills. He just would dismiss it as nature boy stuff. He had this enormous fear of going to hospitals. So when his mom was in hospital, he refused to go into the hospital to see her for no other reason than his fear of germs. He talked to her all the time on the phone, but he didn't actually go to the hospital. And I myself, how can I put it, felt very uncomfortable about that. But um, who am I to comment? Later, of course, after his mother died, he felt really upset and realized that the hospitals weren't full of germs, at least they weren't all aimed at him. And he felt really guilty about not going to see his mother, and it really hurt him a lot. I can remember spending hours when he talked about his gratitude and his feeling for his mother and how he felt he had neglected her when when she was dying I don't think he ever really got over that Glenn was very concerned about uh, his father Bert because he was most incredibly lonely. And eventually he met Vera Dobson and Bert married her. And I think for Glenn that was very hard to accept. Glenn was furious. And I defended Bert. Bert was his own man and did his own thing and everything else. But you get married, you expect your family to be around. And when your son isn't, it bothered him a lot. These things happen between parents and kids. And sometimes they resolve themselves, sometimes they don't. People are people. And even if you're a famous pianist, you're still the people. Some of the appeal that Toronto has for me is gained by default, so to speak. I tend to follow a very nocturnal sort of existence, mainly because I don't much care for sunlight. Bright colors of any kind depress me, in fact, and my moods are more or less inversely related to the clarity of the sky on any given day. Matter of fact, my private motto has always been that behind every silver lining there's a cloud, so I schedule my errands for as late an hour as possible, and I tend to merge along with the bats and the raccoons at twilight. He was driving around in the middle of the night. I happened to be on the radio singing The Time Cycle by Lucas Foss. So the next morning, he called uh, Mario Prezak, who was his uh, producer for the Music Camera series, and said, who is this woman? And phone her and get her for me. I certainly was a little bit overwhelmed uh, at the experience at the beginning. 
a bit nervous. So uh, when we started rehearsing, he says, uh, oh, you seem to want to take a little bit of time and pull this, this particular section. He says, you know, it makes perfect musical sense. And with that, he freed. And it became a collaboration. It, it was sort of like a journey. And there certainly was something magical about that. Cornelia Foss, I'd never met the lady. There were a couple of other ladies, but it wasn't very close. Roxy was special, okay? Because of her collaboration and working together with Glenn, it was a very special relationship with her. When I was working with him, people would be asking me about the gloves and so on. And, you know, they would even say that he sort of looks like a rubby dub sometimes, you know. Uh, but in spite of all that, I found him the most glamorous person I knew. He rehearsed in his apartment, actually. It was always around 10 o'clock or something like that. Actually, at that point, I was very addicted to a program called Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. So we would take a break. Uh, watch Mary Hartman and then rehearse some more till about one o'clock or something like that. She was trying to domesticate Glenn in a certain way and she pulled a certain amount of it off and he went along with it. He loved animals and one of his fantasies was to get some place up in Manitoulin and set up a puppy farm and retire there. So we took a trip just to take a look around. We came across a field and there were a whole bunch of cows and uh, actually started singing a little bit uh, to the cows. And pull your soup lady, take your shirt in to lady, a cake suit in fish and unpaid, in fish and fish and He was a kid in a lot of ways. There was a sort of a joyful exuberance that would come forth every once in a while. And he would do things that were not the gray mathematical person that everybody thinks he was. Broken side of your hair, so broken. Hot monitor, something. Oh, is it? You messed up the words. Perhaps something in a slower tempo. <laughs> I remember he must have said a dozen times, these are the happiest days of my life. And he really meant it. Perhaps the most uh, outrageous thing that Glenn Gould ever did was to record the Goldberg Variations a second time. Many people said, oh, he's gone too far this time. He's more eccentric than he ever was. That people felt they weren't hearing the man that they loved play anymore, that there suddenly there was a crazy guy on this new recording, and it is a different man playing. Now the youthful vitality and virtuosity was replaced by a certain kind of thoughtfulness that I really appreciated. And although it is more eccentric, there are certain things that become more beautiful. It's a man who's poured over this music in every conceivable way and considered all the formal aspects of it and is bringing out more of the depth of the piece itself. I think he would like to feel that in performing music, he presented it um, in the best and most convincing light. And if along the way it touched the hearts and minds of the people concerned, that would have been extraordinarily important to him. Glenn received many, many letters from people who were lonely, who had problems in their lives, who were very unhappy. And uh, he had letters of gratitude. 
I mean, some of them said, Mr. Gould, thank you, you've saved my life. This was part of him getting a certain fulfillment from life, which was very important to him, very important. Glenn Gould, Canada's most famous classical pianist, is in hospital after suffering a severe stroke. He was 50 last Saturday. He had the stroke on Monday, and his family... When he called me, I knew right away that something, he had a stroke or something was desperately wrong. And I went over to the hotel room, and he got up and let me into the room. And, but his condition re deteriorated after that. He, he had his birthday on the Sunday. He had a, he had a stroke on Monday. Uh, then he had several other strokes, and he was, con he was conscious one moment and fading into a coma the next. I remember being with him now in the hospital, and he was getting more and more frantic and agitated, and I knew that I wasn't helping him. I was making it worse. And I'm, to my dying day, I remember walking down the hall and he was calling after me, but I knew I had to leave. And the next day he was in a coma. Then it was just a matter of time. After all had been said and done, there was a silence, and then it seemed from around the walls 
suddenly you heard someone singing. Well, it was Glenn. And so it was the aria from the Goldberg Variations. And when people realized that, a lot of people burst into tears. And when it finished, that was the end. It was goodbye, Glenn. You have all of these narrative elements of a fascinating genius, but ultimately there's a mystery at the heart of Glenn Gould. Every time you think that's what Glenn Gould was about or that's what his life meant, it slips away into something else. And it's the inexplicability of Glenn Gould that keeps people coming back to him. You know, I think a lot of it comes down to this idea of being at home, being at home with yourself, finding a place where you're comfortable. And my belief is that Ultimately, Gould was only ever at home when he was playing music. I think Gould wanted to be remembered as something other than just a pianist. He knew that that was his core achievement, obviously. But he wanted people to realize that there was a whole worldview, there was a whole philosophy behind these performances of his. I also think he wanted to be remembered as a genuinely creative person. He channeled a great deal of creativity into his interpretations, and I think he did achieve one of his goals, which is to be a kind of Renaissance man. Beyond everything else, I hope his legacy would be that he made the world a better place. And that he brought some goodness to it. If there's an Earth, you know, 400 years from now, I think people will know about Glenn Gould. His performances are timeless, that they will live on forever. <laughs>